Hey guys, it's Mr. Y. Today we're going to be getting our unit on genetics. So make sure you're taking notes as you need to, um, get whatever details are required, and make sure at the end if you have further questions that you ask me in class. So today we'll be learning about the base pairs of DNA, uh, reminding ourselves what the monomers of DNA is, learning what the term codon refers to, and then the base pairs of RNA, which are not too much more complicated, and then the major differences between DNA and RNA. So let's get started. All right, first up, um, it's easier to actually learn how to read DNA than it is to actually understand what it is that DNA actually does. So we're going to start with how to read DNA first. And if you uh, were paying attention a little bit in middle school, they should have taught you at least the basics of this. But if not, let's run through this. Suppose this is one side of DNA. This is just one half of DNA. This is one strand. Remember, DNA is a double strand. And on the strand are these letters that we're using for symbolic representation, A, T, C, and G. These represent the individual nucleotides, the monomers of DNA. And they're in long repeated chains. And again, DNA is that double helix. So if we unfold that helix, it looks like a kind of a sideways ladder in this case. And there should be an opposite side down here where we see the reverse side. So <clears throat> the base pairing system for the opposing side of the DNA strand will go as follows. A will always base pair with T. Adenine always base pairs with thymine. G will always base pair with C. Guanine always base pairs with cytosine. And there's a specific reason when you're copying this down that I have three dashes here and two dashes here, so make sure you get that. So knowing those base pairs and knowing that for the most part when you come to DNA that never changes you should be able to predict from just knowing one strand of DNA how the other strand the opposing strand will read so A will go to T T will go to A C to G G to C and so forth you just repeat the pattern um, again T goes to A and then C goes to G so it's, it's reversible there's no real directional system in this but it's always A to T C to G and again when you copy this make sure you get those two dashes here between A and T and three dashes so I would say uh, pause the video here for a moment try this again here I've given you one strand try and see if you can do the other strand you don't necessarily need to copy this whole line system set up but see if you can just you know put a line above the T, G, T, T, G, C, and all that stuff right here, and then make another line, and then just fill in the letters. So I'll pause it for a second, and then we'll go through and make sure you're right. All right, let's check. So hopefully this is what you got. Again, not too difficult. It's very easy to learn how to read the strand because the base pairing system is not that complicated. And that confused people at first with DNA. They thought the system was so uh, simplistic that there was no way DNA could be as important uh, of a molecule as it actually is because it uses such simple combinations to create all the diversity that we see in the modern world. So let's start to talk about what DNA actually is. DNA stands for deoxyribose nucleic acid. Now, deoxyribose is a sugar. It's a sugar specific to DNA. Uh, you don't really find this too many other places, but that's what the D stands for. Nucleic acids, remember, are the monomers of DNA. This is a double-chained polymer, so again, two strands. Uh, again, usually you see this as a classic helical shape of uh, nucleotides, that's the monomers, that are passed from parents to children in all forms of life. Everything from bacteria to protists to funguses to plants to animals, all life uses DNA. Remember, that was one of the requirements for something to be alive. Uh, that we went through in the beginning of the year was that it uses either DNA or RNA. Um, again, the monomers, the nucleotides for these things, you've seen them kind of previewed in the A, T, G, C scale. Uh, there are a different set of monomers for RNA, but it's, they're all nucleotides. So nucleotides are the monomers. DNA and um, RNA are the polymers. Remember, mono means one, poly means many. These are the links. These are the chain of the system. There are five types of nucleotides, though, you really must master for this unit. Again, I've already introduced you to four of them. Adenine, symbol A, always base pairs across to the opposite strand with thymine, symbol T. Guanine, symbol G, always base pairs with cytosine, symbol C. There's a fifth one here, uracil, we haven't seen yet, letter U. And we'll talk about who that base pairs with later when we get to RNA, because that's the only place you see uracil for these. So this is a 
standard diagram of DNA, again, most people recognize the double helix strand for enough pop culture references. Um, this outside area is made up of uh, phosphates, and here's the deoxyribose right here, this pentagon shape, deoxyribose sugar. So it has a sugar phosphate backbone, is what we say, this chain right here, and then the opposing chain on the other side. And then in the middle area is where you find the nitrogenous bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Notice that they're held together by hydrogen bonds. Remember, hydrogen bonds from our chemistry unit are relatively weak bonds by themselves, but when they occur in huge numbers, uh, they can hold things pretty tightly together. Remember, hydrogen bonds were why um, solid water ice floats in liquid water, because it, it allows for gaps between the water molecules. Well, here, it's all hydrogen bonds along the center rung that hold an entire DNA strand together. And notice between the A and the T, there's two hydrogen bonds. And between the G and the C, well, G and the C, there's three hydrogen bonds. Everything else here is a covalent bond. But right here in the center, those are hydrogen bonds. So again, the base pairs for DNA, A and T and G and C, and these little notches in there are kind of hints at why they're so specific to one another. Adenine always forms two hydrogen bonds with its base pair partner, thymine and of course vice versa. Guanine always forms three hydrogen bonds with its base pair partner of cytosine. And cytosine, for instance, doesn't like to form just two. It wants to have three, and adenine doesn't like to form three. It likes to have just two. So they're very specific to one another. So for our purposes, adenine should always be paired with thymine. Again, there's two hydrogen bonds between the two of them. Guanine should always be paired with cytosine. There's three hydrogen bonds between the two of them. So I would make sure you get this down. And again, just make sure you make a note of what those two dashes mean here. Again, you can see this here. This is kind of DNA sideways again. Uh, here's two dotted lines. That's two hydrogen bonds here and here between A and T, and then three hydrogen bonds between guanine and cytosine. So two hydrogen bonds there, three hydrogen bonds there. Again, each dotted line here is a single hydrogen. You can see the same thing here again, just pointing out three hydrogen bonds between G and C two hydrogen bonds between A and T. doesn't matter which direction you're going. There's really not a you know, direction towards the uh, bonds. And again, just so you can see this chemically, this is the actual chemicals, thymine. You see two hydrogen bonds here. Adenine, again, there's where the two hydrogen bonds connect. Cytosine is here, one, two, three, paired with guanine, one, two. A new term that you're probably not familiar with that you need to know is codon. Now, codon, you should associate with the number three. Always think of the number three. And a good way to kind of remember this is, it's not a good way, but it's it's an analogy, is when you think of the word dozen, you think of the number 12. But with codon, you just got to kind of basically memorize, it means the number three. Specifically, it means three bases on a single DNA strand in sequential order. So they have to go in sequence. This would be what we call a DNA codon, and it will become more important as we go through things. So on a single side, not going across, not jumping across the double strand, uh, for instance, TAG here would be the first codon, CC, CGA excuse me, would be the second codon, and then TCC would be the third codon. And um, make sure, you don't necessarily have to copy this down, though it's probably good to get it, but I would definitely get this bottom picture as well, as well as this little label down here, because this will become very important for how we understand DNA to actually work in cells. Because a codon is the basic unit by which... Now, let's talk about DNA's uh, slightly peculiar little cousin, RNA. RNA stands for ribose nucleic acid. Notice the R in RNA stands for ribose, which is a different type of sugar. So with DNA, you had deoxyribose. With RNA, you just have ribose, a different sugar for the for this backbone, this chain here. It is a single chain, so it's single, I should say a single-sided chain, so there's no double helix like you see with the DNA, that's another difference. And again, it's made of nucleic acids, nucleotides, uh, same type of monomers. So the big difference in the shape is the fact that it's single-stranded, not double-stranded, though it can form a helix, just not a double helix like DNA does. And you'll notice there's one other change here in the nucleotides. Here's where that nucleotide uracil shows up, and notice who's missing. Looking back over here at the DNA, you'll see who's missing is actually thymine. So uracil is here, and thymine has disappeared. Now, again, 
that term codon shows back up because you can have RNA codons. And again, it's every three sequential nucleotides. So G, C, U, because again, this is RNA now, would be the first codon. And then here's the second codon, the third codon, etc. cetera. Um, it's still a sugar phosphate backbone. Again, just the sugar is now uh, uh, ribose, not deoxyribose. And A's and G's and C's are still there. It's just where there would be T's, now there are U's. So where there would be thymine, there's now So I would strongly recommend copying down this entire T table for the differences between these two that we've already gone through, but I want to make sure we hit it all at once. First, there's obviously the shape. Um, for the most part, RNA is single-stranded. That's not always the case. We'll learn about why that's not always the case later, but for the most part, you can think of RNA as being single-stranded. Whereas DNA has always got that double helix shape, has two strands, the double helix. At best, RNA might have just a single helix. So understand DNA has to be a double helix. RNA maybe be, I say no double helix. It might be a single helix, a single twist to it. The base pairs. Now, again, base pairs, DNA, simple, A, T, G, C. And you might say, well, you didn't show us any base pairs for RNA. Well, it turns out RNA can base pair to other RNA molecules, and it can base pair to DNA molecules as well. And the base pairing system for RNA works like this. G and C is still the same. That hasn't changed. But again, thiamine has been replaced by uracil. So the new base pair becomes A goes to U. And conversely, U would go back to A. So uracil base pairs with adenine in the case of an RNA molecule. Um, again, every three sequential bases is called an RNA codon versus a DNA codon. So it should be like obvious if they say an RNA codon or DNA codon that, you know, depending on which one you're talking about, you should either see a T or a U. And of course, if you just look at it, you should say, oh, it has a U, it's RNA, or it has a T, it's DNA. And then uh, two other kind of interesting points. RNA is a lot shorter than DNA. DNA is really quite long. When you unravel a single chromosome, uh, it's close to six feet, and it's over a meter easily. Uh, RNA typically is a lot, lot shorter. And because it's so short, RNA has this ability that DNA doesn't have. It has the ability to leave the nucleus. DNA, for the most part, unless the cell is dividing, is stuck in the nucleus. The, the only time you don't find DNA inside the nucleus of a cell is, is if, one, the cell never had a nucleus to begin with, if it's like a bacterial cell, or two, the nucleus has disappeared because of cell division, mitosis, which you guys learned about before. That's the only time you find DNA outside it besides those weird little organelles like the mitochondria and the chloroplasts. But in most cells with a nucleus, the DNA is in the nucleus. It's stuck there unless the cell is itself dividing. RNA, on the other hand, again, short enough that it can leave the nucleus on a regular basis, uh, especially during what we call interphase, that part of the cell cycle where the cell is doing its normal job. You never typically see um, DNA leave the nucleus during interphase. So again, I told you RNA can sometimes actually bind to DNA, and let's work through one of these problems here. At the top, I have a DNA strand, and I've removed the bottom DNA strand, and I've bounded this to an RNA strand. So, again, the top is DNA. We can tell that by having the T's. And, again, every three sequences here would be a DNA codon. I want you guys to just pause the video and try to fill in the RNA codons all the way through here and see if you can do it. Again, remembering the base pairs that I've taught. And pause the video, and then come back when you're done. Okay, let's check. This should be what you got. C goes to G, G goes to C, that's typical. A now goes to U, adenine base pairs to uracil. T will still base pair back to A, because RNA can have it, adenine. Again, G to C, G to C, A to U, T to A, A to U, G to C, A to U. So hopefully you did good. If not, let's give it one more try. Again, pause the video, copy this down. See if you can figure out the answer, and let's check in just a moment. So again, G to C, A to use. If you had a T in the DNA, it defaults back to an A. And if you're really good, at about this point, you should be able to actually catch where my mistake is, because there is a mistake on here, and I'm curious if you can figure it out. That kind of mistake that you're seeing, um, 
is what we call a mutation and we'll talk about what can cause that type of thing to occur later on and it does occur occasionally most of the time it's just not important but sometimes it can have real real big consequences so hopefully you figured out where the mistake was literally it's this base pair here and this base pair here because one of those isn't right um but yeah make sure guys if you're having trouble with this you ask questions in class it's not that hard though i don't think you should be too crazy and again just recall that again dna itself is typically never found outside the nucleus whereas rna is in fact short enough to leave the nucleus uh, during the cell's normal interface state and again during interface you wouldn't see the chromosomes anyway so dna is long rna is short dna can uh, DNA is stuck in the nucleus, whereas RNA, because it's shorter, is a bit more portable. It can leave the nucleus. Plus, there's those other differences, the different sugar, ribose versus deoxyribose, and the different base pairing setup. All right, guys, make sure you ask questions if you have any in class. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video.